Hola amigos, welcome to another shader tutorial, this time using Unreal Engine. Today we're going to talk about post-process materials and a few common effects like edge detection or comparing to grayscale. I have a few who wants to show, so let's get right into it. The first thing to do is to add a new post-process volume. Here's a trick, you can filter menu elements just by starting typing while the menu is selected. In this case, typing post gets us the volume we need. I'll move the object out of the way for now and set the volume to unbound. This way we don't have to worry about its position or scale and it will cover the entire world. Next, I'll assign a material by adding an array element to the list and setting it to asset reference. I already have created a material called post process example that I can select here. And nothing happens. This is because the material I have created has a surface domain, so it's meant to be used on regular objects. But that's easy to fix by opening the material, then selecting the output node to view the properties, and changing the domain to post-process. Now we have a shader that is doing nothing, but at least it's working. Most of these types of effects start with the original color. To get it, Add a scene texture node. However, the default scene color won't work in this case. We need to change the ID to post processing input 0. Now that I have a basic template, let's move on to the effects. The first one I'll cover is a conversion to grayscale based on perceived luminance. Basically, we're going to calculate the average red, green, and blue of each pixel but giving different weights to each element. Break the color information into RGB channels and multiply each one by the following coefficients 0 0.2126, 0 0.7152 and 0 0.0722. And here's another useful trick by the way. Many common nodes have keyboard shortcuts, for example Clicking while holding the M key will add a multiply node. Now I just need to add all the three elements and output that sum. There are a few variations of these coefficients, but any of them is a big improvement over the basic component average. Next effect is a very quick one, an easy way to quantize colors, that is to reduce the number of them, is to multiply by the number desire, then rounding the result, and finally dividing by the same number. The next one is a half-tone filter. This is a technique used in some printed media, like all comics and magazines, that use dots with different sizes and spacing to simulate a smooth gradients with a limited number of colors. First thing I'll do is to rotate the UVs 45 degrees. Not only this will make the effect look better on the screen, but real halftone patterns were often rotated, especially when using multiple colors. I will also set up a simplex noise pattern with a multiplier parameter to have some variation in the filter. The noise node needs a vector 3 input, so I will append a zero constant to the rotated UVs. Now, to make the actual pattern, I start with another multiplier parameter to tile the UVs and increase the dot density. I can now take the fractional part of that result to get a repeating gradient in both axes. If I multiply those values by 2 and subtract 1, I can transform those 0 to 1 gradients into minus 1 to 1 gradients. And since they are in both axes, I can take the length of that vector to create circular gradients. Let's multiply this by our noise and connect it to the output to see the results so far. By playing a bit with the noise influence and dot density parameters, you can see how those values affect the size of the dots.
the next step is to change the size of the dots based on the brightness of our original image. I had a custom function here and the code should be showing up on the screen now, but I thought it was easier to explain how it worked in node form, so here it is as well. I'm taking the pattern and on one side adding the length of the derivatives, the vector formed by ddx and ddy. On the other, I'm subtracting that same vector. Those two will be the upper and lower edges of a smooth step and the original brightness value, the input. Our next effect, edge detection, is a popular one and there are more than a few ways of achieving it. In this video I will show you the two easiest, using the derivatives and sample average differentials. I will leave kernel convolution and using distance fields to a future video when we go over those topics. We can start by using an fwidth function. It's not a node in Unreal, but it's easy to replicate. Take the absolute value of the derivatives ddx and ddy, add them together and output the length of that vector. Although this seems to be working, right now we are detecting the edges on the final image, not the objects themselves. This is why the shadows and any other texture that I could have on this scene would be generating edges. We can instead sample the world aligned normal to find these continuities but, as we can see here, if we have two separated surfaces facing the same way, an edge won't be detected. By the way, note that although the derivatives are super fast on modern GPUs, they are limited to a single fragment, so the result is quite noisy and low res. Another option is to sample the dev buffer or, as I'm doing here, it's base 10 logarithm to get into a more usable range. But we are still going to miss some edges, especially when they are perpendicular to the view direction. The best approach is to make a new vector that combines normal and dev information and sample that one. Here I'm using the x and y values of the normal, but a possible improvement would be to take into consideration the view direction to maximize the number of edges. The idea here is to assign each distinct surface a different color so it's picked up as an edge by the filter later. And now we're getting somewhere, we're getting all the edges represented, but the limitation of the fwidth function makes it a little bit too low res for most applications, we need something better. We're going to average the neighbor pixels and find the difference to the current one. This group of nodes here is sampling the current pixel, so they are using the default UVs. Let's call that the center pixel. To sample the pixels around it, we need to offset the default UVs, adding the 0, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0, etc. vectors to them. However, since this is a full screen post process effect, we need to scale the UVs accordingly, so we need to multiply these vector offsets by the inverse of the texture size, available on any of the texture samplers as the parameter inv size. Now I can duplicate this center pixel group four times, one per offset, connect their inputs, and then average the results by first adding them all together and then dividing by 4. Finally, subtract the average from the center pixel and just like we did before, output the length of this vector. This looks pretty good now, but the filter is too sensitive. We can take out the thinner lines in a couple of different ways but the simplest one is to use a step function and set the threshold to a relatively low value. 0.35 worked well for me in this case.
The last step is to combine the lines with the original image by using a linear interpolation between them, with the lines themselves on the alpha input as well. Now that I see it, I realize that if you are making a cartoon style shader, you probably want to use black lines. A solution. Simply use a 1 minus node on the first parameter of the interpolation to invert the value. Or you can also multiply it with an input color if you want further customization on how the lines look. Now we have crisp, accurate, and temporally stable edge lines. But I can also combine these effects with the halftone pass from before, replacing the B parameter in the custom function. In this case, I'm also going to multiply the source to have a brighter input and thus a nicer looking pattern. Let's add a final improvement to this effect and change the color of the edge lines between black or white based on the surface brightness. This way we can still paint edges on shadowed areas or very dark materials. Start with a step function with a very low threshold on the brightness value. This will give us a crude black and white image that we can use in yet another linear interpolator to choose between light or dark line colors. After testing that the lines are painted in both colors correctly, I can replace the old connection with this new one to combine it again with the image. And that is all I have for today. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. I hope that the video was useful not only to learn how to replicate these effects, but to understand how they work as well. Let me know in the comments what other effects would you like to see explained.